To God be the glory. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, this room this weekend was filled full of a lot of aromas. Uh, some may say musk. Others may say fr um, perfume or whatever. Not really cologne. But it was also filled full of barbecue. Um, and so um, it was an amazing, amazing weekend with our men's retreat. Uh, but more importantly, the Spirit of God was in this room. Amen? Amen. Amen. We have an awesome opportunity to have our brother Alan Robertson come up and share with us and share with this congregation. So Al, if you'll join me up here, we'll pray over you and allow the Spirit to be in this place. Almighty God, Lord, we thank you for this day. And Father, we thank you for your spirit of love. And Father, how that spirit compels us to do great things in your name. But, Father, that also comes out of the approval that we have in your name. Father, we pray that this morning that you open our hearts, you open our minds uh, to what you have to say. Speak through Alan. Father, I pray that uh, you get him out of the way so that you can speak directly to our hearts. We love you, Father. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Good morning, church. It's a great blessing to be here with you guys today, as always. Uh, we were, we did have a great uh, time this weekend. It was just boys being boys, and that's okay, right? Approved men of God, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully you wives out there heard a message that uh, your men left here understanding more of what it's like uh, to be approved by the Almighty God. So I appreciate the opportunity. It's always good to come back here. I've told you guys before that there seems to be this you know, I would say cosmic, but I'd say spiritual connection between the White Street Road Church and Park. And it's been there for a long time. We did share together in the Katrina work. In fact, um, as far as I know, some of our folks are down as well celebrating that uh, 10th year anniversary today. Isn't that great when churches can work together to bring great things for the kingdom of God? That's worth a round of applause. I like that. And it was another amazing, um, you know, crossover today when I was watching the video because Kristen Kellett, who was uh, featured on the video, uh, I watched her grow up uh, at White Street Road. Her dad, Mike, uh, is one of my best friends, is my ministry partner. He and I shared the pulpit together uh, for 12 years at White Street Road. He's still one of our lead ministers. Isn't that great to be able to share one another? And Kristen has a great heart for mission. I love her. Kristen, I'm sure you're here somewhere. Um, and I'm glad to be able to be here today. So we talked a lot this, uh, this weekend about approval and about faith and about what God does in our lives to our men. But that applies to all of us, right? I mean, you know, it's not just men. It's, it's our women as well. It's us as an entire church, but I understand exactly God, what God wants out of us. But sometimes, as I share with different men uh, during the breaks, and even after yesterday, uh, we were finished. You know, sometimes things get in the way. Could be sin. Could be your sin, someone else's sin. Could be distractions. It could be just that time in a marriage or a family where things aren't the way they should be. And so sometimes it's hard to look beyond that, and that's where faith comes in. So today, we're talking about faith and family and future. Because all of us want our future to be in Jesus Christ. Amen? We want to be his men and women of God. Now, I got a picture here. I want to show this picture uh, of, uh, of my family. Uh, is, it was in 1972, this picture. It looks a lot different. There's no beards, as you can see, uh, at that point in time. Mom is, uh, is pregnant with Willie, um, and you see me there with my bowl-cut hairdo. And there's Jace behind him. We're rocking it, you know, with the T-shirts. And there's Dad, who's not a Christian, uh, as this picture was taken. And when you look at this family, you may say, well, you know, that's, a, that's an old pic of a, a, of a young family, but, but what you can't tell from the picture is that this family was in complete crisis and chaos. I mean, we were hurting. And after even this picture was taken and Willie was born, it got even worse in our family. Dark, difficult days. And so uh, the reason I bring that up to you is show the next picture, because Whenever you think about the Robertson family, and we talk about Duck Dynasty, right? Some of you may have seen the show. You think about this family, right? You think about generations and legacies of faith. 
You think about young people who can go on dancing with the stars and yet shine like a star of Christ. And you look at that and you say, man, you know, that's a family that America needs to pay attention to. But you see, this family grew out of that family in 1972. And I can tell you this this morning, that 72 family could never imagine this family. It wasn't even possible to imagine. It was beyond what we could have asked or imagined. And yet Almighty God had a plan and a purpose. If just someone would make a decision, a faith decision, to follow him. It started first with my mom. And I told the men this this weekend. Many times it starts with our wives saying, you know what? I've got to do something different because we've got to be different. And so my mom, in our case, made that first decision to step toward Christ. And i got to tell you something. It was worse for us as a family when she did it. Because now my dad had someone more to blame than he was already blaming on his sin. And so he called her holy roller and goody two-shoes and church lady and all the insults that came because she had made a decision to follow Christ. And it was rough. She was persecuted in her own home. Until finally one day he came to a senses like that young man in Luke 15, and he finally came home to be with the Lord. And our family's life changed. The dynamics changed, and then, of course, the legacy changed to where one day that same man who was a heathen will become a man that is, is recognized in America as a voice for the Almighty as anybody in our country. Is God not good? Can he not do great things? Now, I want to share with you, it's personal to me too, because the same thing happened later on, and I shared this this weekend with me with myself and my own wife, Lisa. We were in high school. We first ran across one another. Uh, you know, I, I finally noticed her. She'd been stalking me since middle school, um, <laughs> and she, she finally caught up with it. She's in the booth, by the way, so uh, she, uh, she finally caught up with me. So show that next picture uh, of us. You know, that was, that was back in the day. I was working the Rico Suave look in those days with the open collar. You know, the feathered hair. And once again, I had lost my way. And when I met Lisa, she needed a guide to a faith and a legacy and a future. She had been abused by an uncle for seven years, which I didn't know about at the time. But then I became that same person again in her life. What a terrible thing. It's the biggest regret in life was that my wife needed a leader and instead, I was a follower of the evil one. But you know what? God, in his infinite wisdom, saw us through not only those days, but I made a faith decision. Later, Lisa made a faith decision. And guess what? Our legacy was changed. Now we have two daughters and two son-in-laws and six grandchildren and a legacy of faith and building. And we are able to travel across the fruited plains and talk about the goodness and the grace of God. That's what happens when people make a decision that God can be number one in our lives. And the reason I want to bring this up at the very beginning today is that I know this from this weekend because I talked to some of the guys. I know some of you are in that struggling place of wondering how can our family ever get past the moment of where we are to be something that we can't imagine being. And I'm here to tell you this morning that all things are possible in Christ. There can be a legacy and a family, and you can look back at a picture over 20-plus years or 40-plus years and say, we could have never imagined that God would have used us in this way. But it starts today, as it does every day, with a decision that Christ has to be number one. I want to share with you a faith decision that I find fascinating because it, it predated Christ by many, many years. In Luke chapter 3, and again, in Matthew chapter 1, you read there's, there's two genealogies there, and both of them are of Christ. Of course, the one we know from Matthew 1 is the genealogy of his earthly father, Joseph, who was not really his father because of Mary's amazing virgin conception and birth. And then the one over in Luke 3, more than likely, is Mary's genealogy, which does link in to the physical person of Jesus. Now, when you look at those two uh, genealogies, what stands out to me is the five women that are mentioned. Because you're not used to seeing women in a genealogy, especially in the Old Testament and some of the other places. And you look at these five women. One, of course, is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, we know Mary was a blessed woman. I mean, she was uh, allowed to be able to carry Jesus and bring him into this world. 
And she was because of her character. I mean, that the angel told her that. But you know, for her day, she was a very scandalous young woman. She was pregnant. She wasn't married. And the story of her being pregnant by virgin conception uh, probably went over about like it would if you tried that story today, right? And people do. We don't believe that. There was a prophecy about Mary, but most people didn't remember that. I can guarantee you that most people in her community didn't believe the story that she and Joseph were telling, even though it was the truth. You look at Bathsheba, another woman in the genealogy. She was the mother of Solomon, a great king. That's the good part of her story. How that happened, not so good, right? And we know that from 2 Samuel 11. There's Tamar from Genesis 38. That's quite a read if I had time to go into that. I'll just give you the short version. She slept with her father-in-law to have a baby and dressed up as a prostitute to do it. Not exactly the things that genealogies are made of, right? Biblically, and yet it's true. There was Ruth, who was a great woman of noble character, one of the greatest, to me, people of character and integrity in the whole Bible. But she was a Moabite. She came from a heritage of an accursed people. You remember when Lot slept with his two daughters and he got drunk? One of those was Moab. One of them was Ammon. She was from that cursed lineage. And then there's the last one, and that's who we're going to talk about today, and that was Rahab. By the way, Rahab was of Ammon descent, the other cursed generation. A lot of people don't know that. And she found herself as a prostitute in a city called Jericho, running a brothel. Now, the only reason we know about her story and that she winds up in the lineage of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is because she was in Jericho. And, of course, Joshua and the people of God were ready to move in and at God's command and to be able to take the promised land, which, of course, when they got out of Egypt, he said, this is where you're going. So they get there and they're ready. Now, Joshua, being a new leader, he said, well, you know, we want to check out and see what the people are saying. We want to find out about hearts and minds in Jericho. So he's been a part of the whole spy game. He's been Jason Bourne in his background. So he sends a couple of spies into Jericho. And they come in, and in Joshua 2, the Bible tells us the first thing they did was go to Rahab's brothel. Now, some of your NIVs will try to we try to dress her up a little bit because it really kind of bothers us that she was a prostitute. So you'll look down the margin and say, or maybe possibly an innkeeper. That sounds like she's in Vermont, you know? I mean, just try to make her sound a little better, right? Because we don't want really a prostitute in the story because it's just too good. The problem is that's not true. And the reason we know that is because when we see her in the New Testament pop up, the Greek word there for her and, and what she did for a living was called porneo. Do I have to go into that word anymore for you to understand? She was a prostitute. It was what it was. She wasn't a Hebrew. She was living. She was making her own way and trying to make ends meet. That's what she did. Our two spies, who were Hebrews, I always find it questionable that that's the first place they went when they hit town. Now, I'm trying to give them the benefit of the doubt, and I figure that they went there because of that may be a place of information. So that's probably true. So they go there, and it's interesting because what happens is Rahab has a crisis moment immediately because the leaders of Jericho, somebody finds out that these two men went to Rahab's house. And they show up and they said, we know that two spies have shown up here, and we want you to turn them over to us. So she's got a choice. Here's this prostitute in Jericho, and these two men probably among a lot of men that come and go from her house, have come there, and she is ordered by her government to turn them over. Now, her smart move, her smart play at this time is to do what? You can say it. It's okay. Turn them over. I mean, she's a good citizen of Jericho. That's what she should have done, and yet she didn't. She told him, she said, you know what? They were here. You're right. But you just missed them. They just went. In fact, I bet if you run down to the city gate, you can catch them before they get out of here. And off they go. This is really a spy moment, right? She goes back inside and she hides them under some flax on the roof. And it's really interesting because the first thing we learn about Rahab 
is that she has a faith that believes all things are possible. There's no doubt. Because that was a faith moment. It didn't look like a faith moment because she just lied to cover it up. But later we're going to find out why. She goes up to those guys on the roof after the pursuers have left, and she tells them, she says, you know what? We've heard about you. I mean, we've heard about your people, and we've heard about what you've been doing. And we are fearful. In fact, the people of Jericho are melting in fear. And the prostitute in the center of town would know that, and she did. And then she said something incredible to me. This woman prostitute who had no reason to believe other than fear, she said this, For I know that the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. That's a faith statement, friends. She made her commitment right then. She believed in the true God, Yahweh. This woman of Ammon, this woman of ill repute, this woman who had no reason to take a step out on faith, did it because she believed God. And that would change her life, that would change her family's life, and that would change her destiny. So she makes a deal with these guys. She says, look, you're hidden out on my roof. I'll slip you out of here. I guess she lived out on the outer wall, so she could slip them out the window. They could leave. And she said, but you got to make me a promise. I've shown you kindness today. I'm asking that you save. But here's what she didn't realize. God already was going to save her. She recognized him as the true God. So now we're just talking about a pathway to salvation. She said, I'm asking you to save myself my mother and father, my brothers and sisters, those that I love, because we believe. So these two guys said, I tell you what, you have provided us with salvation that we didn't lose our lives here today. We'll do the same with you. But there's something you're going to have to do. Two things, actually. Two conditions. First thing is you got to get all your family together. you got to bring them in under one roof, and you got to be here when this thing goes down. And they didn't know when. They knew it was going down. Second thing you have to do is as she's laying this scarlet cord out to let them out from her house, she said, they said, you have to leave this hanging, the scarlet cord out the window. We'll know where you are. You'll be safe. Now, I want you to stop and think just a moment about what that would be like. You know, you have family over, right? We had a large group over last night for dinner over at Kevin Lindsay's. It was great. And you got a large family. You got together at Thanksgiving or Christmas. You love it when everybody comes in. Well, what happens after about a week? Everybody being together, if you were so long together. We're about ready to move on, get back to school, get things going again, right? It's time to go home. Benjamin Franklin said that guests are like fish. They begin to stink after three days. <laughs> There's probably some truth to that. That's why I'm flying home today. I don't want the demons to be, have us stinking around, right? Stinking the place up. She's got her family together, and they're waiting for this apocalypse to happen. And they don't know when it's going to happen. By the way, the two spies, they didn't tell them the plan. They didn't even know the plan. They don't know about the seven times around and the seven days. In a, they don't know about any of that stuff. And we don't even know how long it was before that began. So she's got her family together. And they're looking at her saying, now what's going to happen? And she says, well, I'll tell you what's going to happen. Destruction's going to happen. Well, you know, after a day or two, everybody's ready, and, you know, we don't want to go anywhere. We don't want to miss the moment. And after about a week, somebody says, well, i got to get back down to the store, and I've got this going on, and are you sure about this? Right? How many times does she have to defend the decision that she made to her own family? You say, well, you don't know all that happened. I know family, don't you? You know that Uncle so-and-so is, like, doubting this whole thing from the beginning, and yet she stood her ground because she said, if we leave, we die. See, that's the thing about faith. You can make a faith proclamation. You can make a faith step. But your faith is not worth anything until it's tested. It's going to be tested. And if you don't hold up under the test, you don't have the integrity of God. And so you're going to fail. That means I have to stick with my decision. And that's what I noticed about Rahab. You see, she had a faith that acted but she had a faith that impacted those around her. Instantly, her family knew that. It wasn't just her proclamation. Now it was their proclamation. If we want to be saved, we got to stay here. 
until they come back. And they didn't even know what was going to happen. We read about Rahab, by the way, in James chapter 2, in the same breath as Abraham. What? The father of the faithful and a prostitute? That's what James said. In the same way, after he talked about Abraham, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies? In the same way. Can you imagine the Jewish mind just blowing out of their skull to hear that? You're comparing Abraham and Rahab? Yeah, because it doesn't matter what your name is. It's what you believe and what you act on. We all want to be Abraham. Do we want to be Rahab? Because they're the same person, according to James. They're a person who believes, acts, and impacts where other people know. That's the way I want to live my life. I want to share a video with you guys. It's one of my favorite people from back home because I wanted to tell her story, but I think she could tell it better than me. You got that queued up, guys? Can you show that? For me, I was 15 years old, and my sister just shy of her 13th birthday. It was September the 11th, 1991, when tragedy struck our family. It was that night that our mother was murdered. And within a week, our father was arrested. And within a year, our father was convicted and sentenced to life in prison for the second degree murder of our mom. Pain and tragedy had struck and we had no idea what to do. We were empty and we were broken. It was at that point where we had grief without hope. And it was also during that time that my grandparents moved in with us and introduced us to a church family who loved on us and taught us about grace and mercy. And it was during that time that we accepted Christ as our Savior. At that time in my life, it was only about salvation because I needed hope. So I began to grieve with hope. But I continued to make choices out of what I wanted for my life. I was empty and I was broken, and so all I wanted to do was have somebody to love on me. I met a man who I thought would do those things, would be my protector, and who would love me for who I was. But that relationship and that marriage ended after abuse and abandonment. So the next choice that I knew was heartache. The pain of those words being spoken over to me that I was worthless and that I was useless. But God, that God of ours, put a blessing in my life. And that was when the motherless became a mother. As I held my boy, Grant, and I looked in his eyes, whew, that breath of life was starting to be breathed back into me. But I still continued to make choices out of that pain I trusted no one. And so the next man that I found that I thought could love me, I married again. And within a short amount of time, I was divorced again. So Grant, as I looked at him, I saw two men who had walked out on us, left me empty. But I came back to my family here at WFR who continued to extend grace and mercy to a broken, twice divorced, shame-filled woman. And they continued to teach me about hope. What did I want for my family? What did I want for Grant? You see, they challenged me to step up and to not just be an exception to the things that had happened in my life, but to set a new standard, a standard that would leave a different legacy. But what did that look like and how did that work? I began to be influenced. And you see, there's a difference in influence and encouragement. Encouragement comes by words, and influence comes by action. And when I began to see the intentional discipleship of the church and these women, they gave me hope for a life and a different legacy. And it was during that time when I became open to the teaching and to the leading of what Christ had called me to be. 
You see, I hold on to the scripture in Philippians 3. Press on. Don't look back. It's a strain. Press forward to the goal, to the prize. I had to forget about everything that was behind me and press on to what my goal was. And that was eternal life with my Creator. And it was during that time that I met my husband, Michael. He taught me about unconditional love. He loved me as I was, not as I should be, which is the same way Christ loves me. And so as I began to live in that lavished love, we were married and we had a daughter. I became a mom to a precious daughter. And looking back and realizing the things that I had missed out on with my mother, I became more intentional in the woman that God was calling me to be. He challenged me and these women challenged me to step up and to be the mom that I did not have. To change the legacy that the evil one tried to destroy. God flipped it on its head and said, this is what we're going to do. So as I began to step out and be intentional with my kids, God had another plan for me. And that was to be the woman I am today. To be an encourager, but also to influence by action. To be active in my faith. He calls us to ask, to seek, to knock, to find, to come, to rest. Everything that he has given us is free. That's what Ephesians tells us. It's a free gift. So I accepted that free gift and began to live an intentional relationship. To come to him, to ask him, to seek, and to find. And so now he has called me to be a woman, to stand before other women and share my story. I go behind the walls of prisons and tell these women that there is hope, that they have a chance to change. If you still have breath in you, you still have a chance to change. So breathe it in and exhale him. That's what I'm able to tell these women. I'm called to go and share at different churches now. It went from children's ministry to youth ministry to women's ministry. If God can take a broken vessel like me and use me to teach and to disciple, that's the legacy I want to leave. Would I give anything to have a cup of coffee with my mother? Whew, absolutely. But would I change the course of anything that has been done in my life? Absolutely not. Because I could not stand here and tell you that I would be the woman that I am without the things that I have gone through and without the influence of a community, of a body who believes and influences every step of the way. Pretty amazing, huh? Mindy Lancaster. It was a 25-year... Yeah, you can applaud. It was a 25-year journey, what she just described to you in five minutes. See, that's the problem. We're in the middle of something, and we want it to be solved in five minutes, not five years, and certainly not 25. And yet sometimes that's what it takes to change the course of legacy. I walked through that with Mindy from the trial of her father through the trials of her life. I did her first two weddings, and when she met Michael, I said, I'm not doing this wedding because maybe it's me. Uh, so <laughs> we had someone else do the wedding. What a blessing she is to our church, but now to women in prisons and all across America. It's amazing what can happen when people have faith. And that leaves a legacy for generations. And that's exactly what happens with Rahab. Now, we know what happens, if you remember the story. The Israelites come out, and God gave them this crazy plan that nobody's ever going to draw up in a war room with a bunch of generals. He said, I want you to go in there, and I want you to march around that city. You play your music, and you let them know that the children of Israel is here. And then you go out and do it again the next day, and the next day, for a whole week. And you wonder what the people of Jericho thought at first. And we know their hearts were already fearful. But about after that third day, they think, what is this, a rock concert? What's going on here? What are these people doing? Until that seventh day and that seventh time around. And that loud trumpet sound. And the walls fell out. 
They didn't fall in, they fell out. And Israel went in and took the city because it had been given to them by the Almighty. Except for one little piece with a red cord hanging out a window. Everybody else was killed. And the Bible says in Joshua 6 that he remembered, he remembered, the head of the whole deal remembered that promise that was made to Rahab and her family. Of course, they were saved. And the Bible says when they were taken out, the last thing we read about her until we, she pops up in the New Testament is that they, were, they had to stay outside the camp. Because remember, they weren't Hebrews. And even though she was of faith, she wasn't immediately accepted because she had to go through that proselytizing process. Well, we know it must have happened because she turns up in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So somewhere along the way, she married. She wasn't a prostitute anymore. She reformed. She had her own family. And one of her sons was a man named Boaz who married a woman named Ruth. And it really helps give you some insight into the story of Ruth, doesn't it? When you wonder why Boaz, when nobody else wanted to be around this Moabite woman, why that he would take a chance? Well, you know what? Because he said, my mama took a chance. She was an Ammonite. So I'll take a chance on this Moabite woman. And guess what came out of them? Their union a couple generations later, King David. And you follow the line right on down to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You tell me if God doesn't understand what building a legacy means. But we can't think about it in the moment of now. This is not the woman I thought I was marrying. This is not the man I thought I was marrying. This is not the career I thought I was going to get. And all the things that derail and get in our way of faith. But being able to look beyond and say, but you know what? If I can trust in the Almighty, I can get where He wants me to be. So the man that I didn't marry, it's not that person, can become something by the power of God that I can't even imagine, and it can be better. I stand before you today, and Lisa does as well, as two people who became something totally different that they couldn't have even asked or imagined about. And nobody would have mapped out the plan. Why the scarlet cord? Was it just so they'd say, oh yeah, the red cord, that's the one. It was more than just about direction. You see, as that was hanging out of that window, I believe not only was it a marker to know this is where Rahab and salvation are found, but I believe it was a sign for all of Israel to remember how they came to be saved. Because you remember when they left out of Egypt, what was it? It was under the blood over a doorpost of a Passover lamb that said, sin must be dealt with or you die. And that red cord was a reminder of what it took Israel to get to Jericho. And then if you fast forward a couple of thousand years, 1,500 years, guess what? It's a reminder of a cross that's covered with blood that takes away the sins of of all men and all women. It is a crimson gospel spread across human history as a reminder for each and every one of us that sin must be dealt with or we die. That's why Jesus did what he did. That's why the Passover lamb related to him and his sacrifice. And that's why even the scarlet cord hanging out of the window of a prostitute is a reminder that our God can do anything if we allow him to do it. So when we look at Jesus, our Passover lamb, our sacrificial savior, we see a man and God at the same time that said, I came to save all mankind from the sins of the world. And that's what he did. And for those of us who call on him, we are saying, we can't do it, we can't plan it, but we can trust in the one who can. That's what the cross does. But then he gave us an even better part of the good news. He said, when they put him in a tomb and he came out after three days, you don't have to die and stay dead because I can offer you eternal life. Now, I can tell you something. No health care system, no health care plan is ever going to solve that one. 
Not going to happen. Health care is the number one issue in America. It should be because we're all facing the whole. But without a risen Savior, we have no hope beyond it. No matter how healthy you go into the hole, you stay there unless there's a Savior who can bring you out. And that's what the resurrection does. And then he said something even better. He told the disciples, he said, I'm not hanging around. He hung around for 40 days, just made sure about 500 people knew that he really had risen. And then he left here like Superman without a jetpack. Up, up, and away. And he said, I'm going to heaven to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to give you something even better when I leave. I'm going to send my spirit, the spirit of me and the Father, into you to be me on earth. And it's going to speak to you directly. And then he gave us this to go along with it. They wrote it. What a blessing for us. And so I don't know about you, but I probably would have been like the disciples. I said, well, Jesus, I just assume you stay here. But that's not his plan. His plan is I want to be living there inside you. And so every other person that comes to good news, just like we saw in that video earlier, every person that comes to Christ because of a disaster in their lives and famine, they say, you know what, I want to trust in God. I want to stay in Jericho and wind up in the rubble. I want to come out and be something new and different. We're a part of that, and we see that. We see that joy. That's the Holy Spirit saying, yes, that's why I'm in you. And then he says something even better. He said, I'm coming back. And I don't know about you, but in a polarized culture that we're in today, I'm saying, Lord, I'm ready. I know you got maybe a few more you want to get to, and I know the one that comes in tomorrow says, I'm glad you waited till today, but I'm ready because I'm ready to spend eternity with my Lord. The question I have for you this morning is, are you ready? Because if you haven't embraced that faith, if you're in that place of where Rahab was before those two spies showed up, just being fearful and hoping nothing bad happens to you, and you're just trying to get by one more day, living off of whatever you could do to make ends meet, that's where she was the day before they showed up. But the day after they left, she had purpose. She knew exactly who God was and exactly what he would do to save her, and he did it. And we wind up reading about her in the lineage of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you don't have that faith today, I challenge you to start today. If you need that faith to be renewed, because sometimes it has to be. We have to have, we have, to have life back into dead man's bones, as it was described, because sometimes it happens. We lose that fire, that passion. There's a grieving of the Holy Spirit, as Paul would describe it, where the same Spirit that lives in you, you push Him aside so much that now you're not even hearing or listening at all to who He is. But then all of a sudden something happens, and a stirring comes up inside you, and you want to get back where you were, but not only there, you want to go far beyond that. You have that opportunity. Any day, not just on Sunday. You know what it takes? A proclamation. I know that God is the God of heaven above and earth below, and I want to follow him. That proclamation can be made at any moment. And I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. Not only does it change the moment of today, but it can change your very legacy. Those little ones that just took off to your children's church will be changed by decisions that you make today. So if you need to make that change, encouragement, anything for this church, I want to give you that opportunity as we stand and as we sing. There is a name I 